I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Go, go! <laughs> well, my friends, the month of October has rolled upon us once again, and with every October comes the oncoming approach of Halloween. So I can't think of a better way for us to celebrate the spookiest time of the year than by adorning our streets with pumpkins, adding pumpkin spice flavoring to our latte slash cereal slash whatever the hell else you can think of, and heading down to the movie theater to see the big screen return of America's creepiest and kookiest family, as Charlize Theron and Oscar Isaac provide the voices of Morticia and Gomez in the CGI animated reboot of The Addams Family. But while this new Addams adventure may be one of many adaptations of Charles Addams' comic strip ever since its introduction in 1938, the most beloved version would have to be the live-action Adams Family movies directed by Barry Sonnenfeld from the early 90s, both of which would prove equally popular with the adult fans of the 60s TV show as well as their younger children. And although both of these movies have remained enormously popular over 20 years later, most people have all but forgotten about the third live-action Adams Family movie, which headed straight to video in 1998 under the title of Adams Adams Family Reunion. After Paramount Pictures passed on making a third Adams movie in the wake of Raul Julia's tragic death from stomach cancer, the production rights to the Adams series were quickly bought up by none other than Saban Entertainment, which was best known at the time for importing the Power Rangers from Japan into a kiddie TV phenomenon. And instead of making a direct sequel, Saban decided to reboot the series so that this third film could serve as the pilot for a new Adams Family TV show, with the lead roles of Morticia and Gomez now played by Daryl Hannah and Tim Curry. But though it was made with the intention of being broadcast on TV, the film would first end up going straight to VHS instead through Warner Brothers Family Entertainment label. And ever since its initial release, the film has yet to see any release on DVD, Blu-ray, or digital video. So seeing as this film is available to watch through a YouTube upload, I will find out for myself why this Adams Family adaptation was quickly sent to the graveyard. Besides, this movie should make a far better review than doing the Adams Family porno pair not because that movie's too inappropriate for my show, but because the producers of that movie did not use my submitted title suggestion of the Asshams family. Ah well, here's hoping that porno studio ends up using my other suggested parody title for John Cockenter's Hollow Ream, starring Dongled Pleasant Ass. Ah! Now it's time to start our boozing, grab a beer of your choosing, cause you don't want to be losing the awfully good drinking game. Take a shot or drink every time you see another mailman trying to deliver mail to the Adams residence. As our film opens with a disgruntled mailman using a mechanical device to drop the mail off through the bars of the Adams front gate. But after a crow perches itself on the mail and ends up breaking the postman's doohickey, he must now open the gate so that he can put the Adams mail inside of their sentient and satanic mailbox. <laughs> Oh my god, he totally got his hand bitten off. Oh wait, no he didn't. Ha 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 ha. And the mailman nearly gets himself swallowed up by the mailbox's CGI tongue. Okay, easy with the cartoon mugging there, Mr. Mailman. On the Stooge-ometer, you're coming off less like a Curly Howard and more like a Joe Besser. The mailman ends up landing on the front yard of the Adams residence, where we are yet again reintroduced to the mostly recast members of the Adams family. Most notably, the father, Gomez, now played by Tim Curry, and the mother, Morticia, now played by Daryl Hannah. However, we do have two returning cast members from the original Adams movies, with Lurch the Undead Butler, played by Carol Stroykin, and Thing the Disembodied Hand, played by Christopher Hart. Because it's a great sign when the only two actors you could convince to return from the original movies are the ones you don't have to pay for saying any dialogue. Gomez calls the family into the living room for a family meeting, where he reveals to his relatives that today's mail happens to have included a very special book. It has arrived! <laughs> Actually, the book happens to be the complete and unabridged book of Adams, which includes the names and details of every single living, dead, or undead member of the Adams family. And Grandmama discovers that the publishing company behind the book has a mail-in offer that will put the Adamses in touch with the surviving members of their family so that they can arrange a family reunion. 
What a glorious day! <laughs> and after the movie drops one of its many lightning bolt scene transitions so that they can cover up where the commercial breaks were supposed to go, the family steps outside to meet the visiting Adam's grandparents, played here by Estelle Harris of Mrs. Costanza and Mrs. Potato Head fame, and late great character actor Kevin McCarthy, best known from Invasion of the Body Snatchers and UHF. But as the two grandparents stay in the Adams house over the next few days, the rest of the family is horrified to find that their relatives are acting a little bit strangely. Which is to say that the grandparents are doing perfectly normal things for people of their age, and Uncle Fester finds out what disease is afflicting the two grandparents. Alzheimer's, a rare tendency towards ordinary behavior and ballroom dancing. It pops up from time to time as age increases, and there's no no cure! Well, either it could be this Waltzheimer's thing you're talking about, or perhaps the body snatchers have finally gotten their hands on Kevin McCarthy! that's when the Family Tree Publishing Company finally sends them an invitation to the Adams Family Reunion, which Gomez sees as an opportunity to find out whether any of their family members know of a cure for their Waltzheimer's afflicted grandparents. Maybe, just maybe, we have a talented witch doctor in the family! <laughs> so now the Adams Family takes off for the swanky Primrose Resort, where the Family Reunion is being held. But it just so happens that the publishing company's computer system has been on the fritz, and has accidentally sent the Adamses over to the wrong family reunion. They spelled Adams with only one D. You would think that a company dealing in matters of family heritage would at least spell our name right. Now if only they had mixed up all the letters in their last name and accidentally had them attending the Saddam family reunion. That would have been a much better movie. Suffer and suck attack! So the Adams family arrives at their fraudulent family reunion and are greeted by the reunion's organizer, Dolores Adams, played by Sister Beach from the Nicolas Cage version of The Wicker Man, and her doctor husband, Philip, played by Ed Begley Jr. Philip is a leading psychiatrist. A witch doctor. Mister must be psychic. And Gomez soon gets to work trying to convince the doctor to examine his grandparents. First, it was Matlock. Then, the Tupperware. Yesterday, I heard them saying to each other that they would like to meet Willard Scott. No, no! However, Dr. Philip happens to already be dealing with an elderly relative of his own, his cranky father Walter, played by Ray Walston, whom Philip is trying to secretly poison to death so that he can rearrange the old man's will and make off with his dead dad's money, as he works in cahoots with his snooty sister, Catherine. I know for a fact you've been poisoning daddy. If I don't get my full share of these days, I'm going straight to the cops. Hey, you know what? That actress playing Catherine looks awfully familiar. Let me just put some black hair on her, and a mask, and a red latex dress with a giant rack. Holy shit! It's Diva Talks from Turbo o Power Rangers movie! Come on, Saban Entertainment! Haven't you embarrassed this poor woman enough? What's next? Are they gonna bring in Alpha 5 to play Cousin It? Anyway, we see that Wednesday and Pugsley are sent outside to play with the kids from the other side of the family. And much like how the last movie saw Wednesday falling in love with David Krumholtz over at summer camp, this movie now sees Pugsley making goo-goo eyes with Gina, a shy, nerdy girl played by Hilary Duff's older sister, Haley Duff, dressed up here like a pint-sized Professor Trelawney. And speaking of Pugsley, it turns out that Uncle Fester has been working on a present for Pugsley's birthday by genetically modifying a cute little chihuahua named Butcher, so that the dog can instantly turn into a ferocious attack dog with the help of some trigger words. Good boy! Stick up! But after Fester sneaks the dog into the hotel and ends up losing track of it, he must enlist the help of Thing so that the two of them can find Butcher before the terribly CGI dog ends up frightening the hotel guests to death with its resemblance to a burnt turd. You take the rest of the guest quarters, I'll take the lady's son. <laughs> the boy, it's like I'm watching the live action adaptation of Fester's Quest that nobody fucking asked for. And if that wasn't enough wacky subplots for you, 
Where is Joffrey and his floozy little wife? That's right, there happens to be two members of the other Adams family who have accidentally been sent an invitation over to the Adams mansion. And after their car ends up getting a flat tire, they're forced to spend the night at the mansion alongside the house sitting grandmama and cousin It, who sadly is not voiced here by Snoop Dogg. I can't believe you just lost our entire 401k and the condo in Maui! I'm sorry, honey. You gotta admit, he's got a good poker face. Basically, this subplot is like watching a remake of an Abbott and Costello haunted house comedy, which is now starring the snobby next door neighbors from Christmas Vacation. I can't walk out of here looking like this! What if somebody sees me? I don't know, Margo. But amidst all these uninteresting subplots and corny sitcom jokes, I do have to give credit to Daryl Hannah and Tim Curry for doing a perfectly good job filling the roles of Morticia and Gomez, even if the material prevents them from matching the pitch-perfect job done by Angelica Houston and Raul Julia. How do I look? Just to kill, or at the very least, to man. And Tim Curry in particular gets a lot of fun stuff to do alongside Ed Begley Jr. as the two of them bet their money against each other in a series of sporting competitions. How about tennis? Triple or nothing? No use beating a dead horse. Maybe not on your side of the family. And while Gomez's tennis game may have some assistance from his backflipping stuntman, Dr. Philip has got a trick up his own sleep after Wednesday and Pugsley spice up the game by secretly injecting his tennis ball with nitroglycerin. Uh-oh, that's not good. Get his luck, Gomez! This game's mine! Prepare to die, you fool. night, Gomez and Morticia attend the family reunion dinner inside of the hotel ballroom, and after Walter Adams ends up getting his hair cut into a mohawk by Fester while he's asleep, he comes up on stage at the dinner to deliver the funniest moment of this film. You're nothing but a bunch of lazy, worthless freeloaders. I'd sooner drop a screaming walrus down my pants than spend another minute with the entire lot of them. I'd rather see you all roasted in the deepest pits of hell! I don't think Ray Walson is reading from a script here. I think he's just yelling at the crew for putting him in this crappy movie. Then the humiliated Dr. Philip comes in to have a brawl with Gomez, and then Fester comes in chasing after the dog, and now the movie has fully completed its transformation into a noisy and desperate sitcom. Yes, I understand that this film was intended to be the pilot for a new Abs Family TV show, with the only actor returning for the TV show being the girl who plays Wednesday. But it is really hard to separate this movie from the original Barry Sonnenfeld movies after you read this Yahoo interview which was conducted with the film's director, Dave Payne, who claims that Saban Entertainment threw out all of his original ideas and forced him to make a film that resembled the stylistic camera work of the Sonnenfeld movies, but with a more family-friendly sense of humor in line with the original TV show. And even with these creative constraints, you can tell that Dave Payne and his cast are trying their damnedest to make the best movie possible with the movie ending on a fairly good note in the film's fast-paced final act. Gomez and Morticia are taken away by the cops and locked up in a jail cell. Wednesday and Pugsley are taken away by Child Protective Services and sent to live with Dolores Adams and her white bread family. Fester is taken away to a psychiatric ward where he receives electroshock therapy from the vengeful Dr. Philip, and both Butcher and Thing are taken away to a dog pound after getting caught by a dog catcher, played by the one and only Clint Howard, who surprisingly does not end up playing a member of the Adams family. You are one strange looking little dog. Thankfully, Ray Walston comes in to save the day by bailing out Gomez and Morticia as the three of them drive off to reunite their separated family, but not before they first rescue Lurch from being buried alive after he sleepwalks into an empty coffin. Lurch, are you in there? Okay, I gotta admit, that joke was fairly clever. Next, they save Fester from the psychiatric hospital after Gomez attacks the hospital guards by magically turning into a vicious dog at- oh. Wait, sorry. I'm getting my Tim Curry movies mixed up again. <laughs> Wednesday and Pugsley are rescued before they get a chance to torture the other Adams family, while Thing and Butcher are rescued from the pound while the dog is in the middle of attacking Clint Howard's face. As if Clint Howard's face isn't already fucked up enough! And not only do the grandparents end up living with Dolores' family, but those other two Amses end up escaping from the clutches of Grandmama and Cousin It. <laughs> 
boy, this Shining sequel is truly underwhelming. So now the Amps family is back under the same roof again, just in time for a celebratory fireworks display. And even though Pugsley sadly forgot to bring the quote-unquote Siberian firecracker which he received from his grandfather earlier in the movie, the firecracker ends up closing out the fireworks by going off at a nuclear explosion that kills off all the rest of the characters. All is fair in love. Hey, just because this Abs movie doesn't have the opening tiles designer from Doctor Strange Love doesn't mean it can't have the same ending as Doctor Strange Love. Now I feel the swift approach of nuclear winter. Come, Karamir, let us escape with our family to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism. Space! Space! As hard as it may be to completely hate this movie, you cannot ignore how Saban Entertainment is cynically trying to imitate the previous two adaptations instead of making a genuine reboot with its own unique voice. And without the ornate production value and subversive PG-13 humor that helped define those first two Adams movies, Adams Family Reunion is nothing more than a harmless curiosity for fans of this franchise, which is not without a couple of laughs to be had. If only Charles Adams had lived long enough to see this movie, I wonder what he would have thought of it. You sold my cartoon to the Power Rangers people? I'm dragging you to hell! And on the closing theme song watch, where the first movie's closing credits had a theme song from MC Hammer, and the second movie's credits had a theme song performed by Tag Team, the credits of the third movie actually has a rendition of the original classic Adams Family theme song, as performed by another popular music act from the 90s, uh, Straight Vocals. They're creepy and they're kooky, mysterious and spooky, they're all together ooky, the Adams Family. Wow, when your theme song manages to outsuck both MC Hammer and the Whoop There It Is guys, you have got some serious problems. Nice multicolored shirt you're wearing, guys. It really matches the vibrant colors that one usually associates with the Adams Family. Oh well, at least I like this theme song better than the theme song for the new Adams Family movie. Family, family, family. I go to war with my family. I seek justice. Denied. Oh yeah, suck on that hot diss, Migos and. Carol Kane and Rock and Roll Mafia and Cousin It. Uh, shots fired! On the enjoyableness continuum scale from Bull to Bruce, Adam's Family Reunion manages to make the new Adam's Family look like the monsters today and sticks a light bulb in its mouth to reach a wattage of 5 out of 10. And since Saban also did a Ninja Turtles reboot around this time, I'm glad they never went through with that crossover. <laughs> You were expecting maybe, uh, the Adams Family? Tonight! <laughs> I'm Jesse Shade for JoeBlow.com, and stay tuned later this month for the second half of our 2019 Awfully Good Halloween Special. Because it just so happens that Saban Entertainment did another direct-to-video follow-up for another 90s Halloween movie, which also starred Christina Ricci. Casper, the friendly ghost. I would rather douse myself with kerosene and light a match. Not to worry, Wednesday. I'm way ahead of you there.